This is problem 22 from 16.7, a surface integral. It's not surface area. It's a surface integral. And it's the, the wording is meant to be the two-dimensional version of a line integral. So remember, a line integral, the domain was a curve. And they're using line as kind of a generic word for curve instead of calling it a curve integral. Everybody calls it a line integral. Well, here we got a surface integral. So the domain can be some lumpy surface. That's your domain. Instead of having a little box, you know, for x and y, or a little two-dimensional flat region, now the region can be bumpy. And it measures a thing called flux. Flux looks like this. You have your surface, and it's actually a piece of surface. You don't have a, uh, a surface that goes on forever. Now, you could have a closed surface, like a ball. That would be OK. But you got to have some finite surface. And you're measuring the flux, which is your vector field, how much of your vector field actually passes through this surface. And does some of it go back that way? So you'll have, you're going to designate what the positive direction is. And in, in our uh, calculus book, and this is in any book, electrical uh, engineering anywhere, it's the outward flow that is measured as the positive. So just, you know, like a pin cushion, the needle's all pointing out. A porcupine, the needle's all pointing out. That's the positive direction. So that's what we're measuring is how much of this stuff is flying through. I have no idea what the measurement unit is, but that's what we got. And the notation is this. You have the vector field, and you have your surface. So if you remember in the line integral form, the line integral looked like this. We had a C, and we had an F dot dr. So the, even though we're going to call our surface r, the book doesn't want to have dot dr because then it looks a little bit like a line integral. looks maybe too much like a line integral. So they went with dot ds. Mm. That's what you get, you know. But you can tell, you can tell it's a surface integral because two-dimensional, you got two limits of integration instead of just one for a line integral. So it's got to be a surface integral even though that vector field is the same and there's a dot with some kind of parameterization. So we have to have a parameterized surface. And because it's two dimensions, we get two parameters for our surface. That's another big difference between this and a line integral. The line integral, if you remember, the, the curve was parameterized with one variable. So you can parameterize with two variables. Parameterizing with two variables is actually pretty easy. The book spends a whole section on it which is previous to this, 16.6. .6. You can just kind of look at the pretty pictures. Imagine that you're allowed to have now a function for each variable based on two variables. So each function is a two-variable function. If you think about it, it just opened up a whole new world of possibilities. And they have some very pretty pictures in the book of, of these things. You can actually plot these things in Maple. But we're not going to take the time to do that. Next Tuesday's class is going to be in the regular classroom because we need all the time we can with the big board. The little board up there is just going to be too constraining. Anyway, so to get a parameterized surface, it's very easy. Suppose you have f of xy equals uh, x squared plus 2xy plus 5. Let's say you have that. You could have the following parameterization if you wanted. You could just take u, v, and u squared plus 2uv plus 5. And that's a parameterization. If you remember the cheap parameterization for one variable, you let x be t and let y be whatever the function of t was. But those were boring parameterizations. You were, you were doing a parameterized version of something that you already had a formula for, and you're basically just copying the formula. Well, you can do that here, too. Or you can have something like this, where you have some really fancy stuff going on in each position. The book does uh, ask you to parameterize um, various surfaces, like, like we did the quadric surfaces. So parameterize the hyperbolic paraboloid. These tricks all work. But what you might notice is, what's the difference between this and this, really? Because this is the z coordinate in terms of x and y. Why not just use x, y? and the function of x and y right here. The book does that. It gives you an alternative version of the parameterized formulas. But it does everything in terms of the parameterized formulas because that handles all the cases. 
But in case you have this structure from the beginning, the book has nice little shortcuts for that. So what's going to happen is next week as we do more problems, you'll see that we can we can look at the problem and say, okay, what's the situation? Hey, I've got f of x, y all the way through. I could just do this problem in terms of x, y. So you can. The book allows it. So do I. But it's just an option. Let's do this one out, though. We're going to do this. So here's the problem. I have this for my surface, and it's called a helicoid. It's a helix that has been turned into a surface. It's, it's, it's like you have, you wanted to have a spiral staircase, but you needed to make it a ramp. So it's like a parking ramp. You have a central axis, and then this circular, you know, this helix going around the outside with a radius of 1. And then this ramp goes up from just 0 to pi. So it actually just starts and goes around to the opposite side of the z-axis from where it started. And that's what, and then it stops there. So it's just this one half turn. It's shaped like the fin of a bolt. When you have a bolt, or think of it, an ice auger, a drill that you use to make a hole in the ice when you're going to go ice fishing. There's this nice blade. Or the blade of a propeller-driven boat, but the propeller usually the, the point goes to a point. You know, the, the blade of the propeller goes to a point. This guy has the same radius going all the way out. And when it says u equals 0 to 1, it means that you're taking on these values from 0 to one all the way out. As this thing, as this fans around, these, sorry, these radii are all one. You know, the radius from the z-axis out to the edge of that spiral ramp, it's one. You don't really need to know what it's shaped like, but that's our surface. And we have a vector field, z comma y comma x. That's our vector field. So if you remember from line integrals, what we're going to do is the same thing. I'm going to take the z function put that right there. I'm going to take the y function, put that right there. I'm going to take the x function, put that right there. I'm going to dot it with the derivative of this thing. But it has to be the derivative of the first with respect to the first variable, the derivative of the second with respect to the second variable, derivative of the third with respect to the uh, uh, third variable. We'll see what that means in a second. We'll see what that means in a second. You'll see. You'll see. So, because uh, you really only have two variables here. You'll see what I mean. You'll see what I mean. We'll get that in there. All right, so i got to make space on the board, so I'm just going to pause for a second. Here's the formula right out of the book. So we don't actually substitute in, or sorry, we don't just take the derivative of r with respect to the coordinate variables just all in one shot. They each take a turn. I'm going to do, in the formula for the book, it's f dot, and this is a vector, the derivative of r with respect to u crossed with the derivative of r with respect to v. So that's how we get around having this two-dimensional domain living in a three-dimensional world, and we have to take the appropriate derivatives. This is the move. This is how you get the uh, measure of the flux. So you have, we've met this before, that's our helicoid. And here's the partials with respect to u. Here's the partials with respect to v. And we're going to get that cross product. Well, let's do the cross product the usual way. So we write the i, the j, and the k up here. And this comes out to b. Here we go. Let me get the camera fixed on the, the rest of the stuff. That looks good. All right. So I'm doing blocking out this column, and I have sine minus 0, sine b. Blocking out this column, and I have cosine b minus 0, but it has to be negative cosine b because it's the, the middle guy. And then blocking out this column, I have u cosine v times cosine v. So that's u cosine squared v minus negative u sine squared v. So that's a plus u sine squared v. Well, we know what that is. That just adds up to u. How great is that? So I get a u right here, and that's my cross product vector. That's pretty nice and clean. And if you remember, the helix was our go-to curve when we were first learning a lot of stuff about, uh, about vector calculus. Helicoid is like a surface integral, or it's a surface that's a real close relative of a helix, and things work out nice for helicoids. 
So, just like things work out nice for, for helices. All right, I'm going to be erasing this and setting up this integral, but I'm hanging on to that vector like grim death because that's what goes there. And now, if you understand line integrals, you understand what to do right now. I'm going to put in my vector field stuff, get that vector, and I'm going to dot it with this vector, which means I'm now going to have an integral that's a double integral in terms of du dv. It's a regular old double integral. And the variables are just u and v, and, we're, and we do that integral and we get the right answer. That's how this goes. So you start with this conceptually weird integral, and you turn it into an integral that you can do through this recipe. Just like if you go back to the line integral, you have this funny looking formula with a, a letter C down below the integral symbol, but we turn it into a single integral in terms of t, and we do that integral. Well, this is a double integral in terms of uv, and we do that integral, and that's how we get the right answer. So we're going to finish this thing up. Thanks for not going away. So here's our big dot product. The vector field was, if you remember, it was z, y, x. So from my r curve, the y stayed in the y spot, but the z, the v, that was z, goes in the first spot because that's what the vector field says. And then the, the original x-coordinate of the vector field becomes the z-coordinate here because my vector field was z, y, x. So I have to take the x-coordinate of the curve, x-coordinate of the curve, oh, sorry, x-coordinate of the surface and put it in the z spot because it's what the vector field substitution said to do. So you got to do the vector field substitution. So you're substituting the curve, sorry, the surface into the vector field, just like you do with the line integral. That's why I'm, I'm getting mixed up with what I say because it's the same... Stuff, same concept. And then you dot it with this guy, which we already computed. There he is. So here's the dot product all done out. And now let's just look down the road. I'm going to be doing this double integral. I've got a V sine V. At some point, I'm going to have to do an integration by parts for that dude. I'm not worried about it. It's not the worst thing in the world. This guy's very tame. These, these two don't rock and roll with each other. I'll just be treating this like a, a variable first because I have du. And then I'll be integrating sine. And... Uh, or sorry, sine times cosine. Sine times cosine is an easy integral. And then I have, this will be just uh, u, u cubed over 3. Cosine v just hangs out. So there's the next step. I do the integral with respect to u, get a u additional power on each one. And I'm going to have all these u's go to 1, and I'm going to write a minus sign. All these u's become 0. Well, putting 0 in all these wipes out the whole thing. So this whole thing really just becomes a 1 there, a 1 there, and a 1 there. And now I'm ready to do, just a second, let me make this not a lie. There we go. Now I'm ready to take a look at the V situation. Integration by parts here. We'll do it up. This guy, that's sine from 0 to pi. Well, sine from 0 to, or sorry, that's not sine. It's sine times cosine. So this guy is going to be integrated into, since the derivative of sine is cosine, this will be sine squared v over 2. So I can do that integral. And then this guy is cosine from 0 to pi. Well, cosine 0 to pi is a net 0 integral. If you remember, it does this much 0 to pi. The upper bump cancels with the lower bump. So this guy right now is a 0. I don't even have to integrate that piece. I know that's going to contribute 0 to my answer. So I'm down to, after this big long problem, I'm down to just doing these two pieces, and that's next, and we're done, and we will match the book answer, I guarantee it. Let's finish this bad baby. Here we go. The integration by parts uh, algorithm uses a V, so I'm going to use a script V for the V that's in the integration by parts algorithm. It tells me where to put everything. Pointy V is the original V that we've got here. You got to live with that. You got to find a way to survive these kind of notational difficulties. <laughs> anyway, so uh, integration by parts on this thing. Uh, you see the pieces, and it turn this first term turns into negative v cosine v plus this thing. This is another big zero. I got a net zero right there. This piece, let's do it. It's the negative of pi cosine of v is negative one minus zero. So there's pi right there, negative, negative pi. And this guy, the sine of pi is 0, and the sine of 0 is 0. So this whole thing is 0 minus 0. There's the answer. 
that is the book answer. We triumphed. We did a surface integral. So remember what all this stood for. We started with just this kind of small thing compared to how much writing we did. But the big idea is this. It's like when you're going to cook a really fancy dinner. You have to prepare all these pieces ahead of time. In this case, this is the prep ahead of time. you got to do that R sub U. you got to do the R sub V. you got to do that cross product. Then you're ready to do the usual stuff. So you do what it says to do, but it's some pretty fancy things. Anyway, the book answer is pi. We win. See you later.